Hey, welcome to your new episode with Roxanne Split, a game designer and associate design director at Insomniac Games. We had a really interesting conversation that I think you're going to find helpful, uh, hearing their journey starting in art, moving into design, going from serious games to working on things like Spider-Man 2 in the AAA arena. If you find this useful or helpful, please like and subscribe so I can help new people find out about the show. Thanks. Hey, Roxanne, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Getting over the flu here. Uh, hopefully I won't be coughing. And uh, if I do, I'll be editing it out. But um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into the first question. Um, so what part of the world are you calling in from tonight? So I'm East Coast. I live in like a suburb of Richmond, Virginia. Cool. I've heard good things about that area. So what's your current role right now? So I'm an associate design director at Insomnia Games. Ah, that's a little game studio. I don't know. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Thinking back, you know, to your career and stuff, how did you get started in the game industry? So that's a good question. I'm trying to think of like <laughs> the the straightest path. So I, for years and years and years, was part of like the serious games kind of space. And honestly, like before that, my first jobs coming out of school were like for government contractors doing like e-learning and simulation, like mm -hmm. game-based training, basically. Yep. Um, I always knew <laughs> that I wanted to like be in games. I was like, that; those were my interests in high school and things like that. I took like computer graphics classes um, and mm -hmm. I ended up going to art school for like 3D modeling animation because I didn't know <laughs> like what the game industry was. I sort of had this sense of what was involved. And I thought either you had to go like art or you were a programmer. And I was like, well, right. I can't do this. part. <laughs> so I will like, yeah. I'll do the art side. Yeah. And then just by virtue of like, so I said, I'm in Richmond now. I grew up um, in a suburb of DC. So like a couple hours, like North right. and that it's like a very sort of like company town and the company is the government. Right. <laughs> there are a bunch of like, uh, you know, contracting, like consulting firms who were looking for people, not with like game degrees, but like folks who could do like 3D modeling and programming and stuff like that. So yeah, I was like, I will do this <laughs> because it's like here uh, and I can, mm -hmm. I, you know, I got an interview and, and got hooked up with like a team that was doing, yeah, e-learning and training and then kind of hung out in that space <laughs> for like 10 years. Wow. Uh, I'll, you know, when I joined, so I graduated in like 2009, which was like mm -hmm. the tail end of like Flash. Mm. <laughs> it's like, Right. dying right. <laughs> and I think like our learning team kind of hung on to it a little bit longer than was maybe like reasonable so when I joined we were making essentially like point and click adventure games <laughs> okay. to like to train organizations we were making like pre-rendered backgrounds that's like those were the first things I did for the first couple of years where I would like mm -hmm build an office or, or something or rig characters and render those out as animations. And then there'd be like multiple choice questions and stuff like that. But very quickly, like, I think one of the best things that that team did was they were like a very early adopter of Unity. <laughs> so oh, wow, like right. right at like 2010, we sort of jumped on like Unity and started building out equipment simulations and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was where like, even though it was not explicitly games, I got experience like very early on doing that type of software development where, you know, you're working with a multidisciplinary team, you're learning like that pipeline yeah. <laughs> from like, Game you know, yeah. yeah, Maya to optimizing stuff to like putting it in engine to like working with uh, other disciplines and stuff. So mm -hmm. that, that was like the very sort of like inception of, of me starting to do things that were kind of like game adjacent. And then you will know this, JP. Yeah. <laughs> but I, uh, I, after doing that for like many years, I left uh, and joined Level X, which I thought you guys were doing like basically the same stuff. Right. And I remember that like ruffling some feathers in like right. my interview, which I think I called like Palm X like a simulator, and like somebody stopped me and was like, right, "Oh, right. hey, call these like right. <laughs> this don't is say like, the G word, gamification. Right? <laughs> no, not gamification. Ugh. Yeah, because I like looked at like the portfolio and I was like, "Oh, I know what this is. This is like training based things. It's like games yeah. that like teach you things." Uh, and then uh, when, when I got there, I was like, oh, my God, this is like very different. These are all kind of like industry people 
who like don't consider themselves <laughs> like right. a learning shop, but are trying to like structure this like the way you know gaming studios do. And there's just like a completely different sort of mentality of how to go about like the work that was very sort of like experience centric and stuff. Yeah. Um, and then from there, that was kind of like. I don't think there's a version <laughs> of this story where like I go on to Insomniac without getting that job first because it, it mm -hmm. really sort of like I like learned how a studio worked <laughs> really at, right. during, for the two years that I was at Level X and I think that really kind of cut my teeth into like that part of like the culture and just sort of mm -hmm. how it was different from consulting and the type sort of of skills that are like valued like in that space so right, that, that's right. like the the long and kind of like winding version where it was like went to school for art wanted to do games kind of like did this training thing for a while and then mm -hmm. sort of like moved from level x into the triple a space yeah that's cool and what do you wish you had known when you had started thinking back well i think like if i look way way back to like baby Roxanne who was like 17 and, <laughs> and like watching a documentary on like Halo 2 or whatever I wish mm -hmm. I had known that like game design was a thing because <laughs> right. like it took me a while to kind of like back into that like I said I, I started in 3D and I, I kind of like moved with the same group of people from like one company to Delight Digital where I spent like six years mm -hmm. uh, and when I made that transition, my role actually changed from 3D modeler to game designer, someone who like actually monitored like the experience <laughs> of the content and things like that. Yeah. But I literally didn't know that that was a job. That, <laughs> yeah. that, so I think it's like good, you know, to know just from like a goal setting perspective. But like, I think if you look back at like my quote unquote sketchbooks from art school, they are, <laughs> you can like tell I'm like a designer because I just have like these right. lists and wireframes right. that are happening. And then I guess like the other thing that I would say that I wish I knew was just that like uh, that the game industry was like an option for me. I like really didn't feel that way for, for a long time. And I feel like a mm. lot of people, this isn't unique, right? It's just like, if you like games a lot, you just like right. don't know to break in. It doesn't seem like something that is possible or like you're like, I don't know where to, to start and everything. And I think it was, I felt that way, like sort of still feel that way, honestly. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah. like I felt that way until I think I was like applying for jobs like in my 30s, you know, just kind of, especially the job market even now is much different than it was when I like joined Level X, which was like 2019. Yeah. Uh, and then I remember like I had a like an Excel doc where I just tracked, you know, all the things I applied to, all the things I got responses back to, mm -hmm. if those converted to interviews, if that converted to something else. And it's just like the fall off and the rate <laughs> <laughs> right. kind of accounts to success. There's just, you have to have like such a thick skin and be so like, okay <laughs> with hearing silence and not right. exactly how to change your approach that like, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if I just knew, like, that's the way it is, and sometimes it has nothing to do with you, and, like, jobs are situational, and the right. best there at the time, <laughs> like, right. gets the job, like, I think it wasn't because, like, you're not talented, no one likes you. <laughs> yeah, right, like, you're a loser, that's why you can't get, no, it's Yeah, or it's yeah, like, yeah. you're not here because it's like, yeah, you're not, like, good enough to, like, do this. Uh, I think, like, everybody at some point feels some version of that, especially if you're trying to do kind of like a conversion thing, like I did, where I was like, yeah. I think I'm like trying to make this hop into games. Like, how am I going to do that? I basically had this yeah. like other career for like so, so long. So I think, yeah, right. just, it sounds cheesy and goofy, but just like knowing that it's totally possible. <laughs> it's not so like ivory tower, like it's, magical yeah. and mystical and, and how do you do that I, I mean back you know when i was in the 80s in high school i i don't remember saying this but i was telling someone like i told my mom and a friend like yeah i'm, I'm gonna make video games and that just seemed like the craziest thing in the world to say uh, yeah mm -hmm. I, I might as well said like i'm gonna be a, a freaking astronaut or something right, right? But it's it like just, i'm gonna play in the nfl like <laughs> right yeah it's like i'm gonna be in the all-star game as a quarterback I'm like what you can't even play yeah. football you idiot like what are you even thinking <laughs> so yeah it seems bizarre and unattainable but at the end of the day it's just people with skills in different areas working together and doing cool stuff and you know when you don't get a job it's you have to take the context of like if that's happened 400 times well maybe my resume and my background i need to retool and rework that but at the same time you also have to have thick skin and not just be like I i'm terrible it just maybe there's candidates that are a better fit that are closer right like 
there's a lot of times it's like, eh, this is a good candidate, a lot of stuff, but we have an amazing candidate and the amazing candidate, you know, gets the job. But yeah, it's, it's just a numbers game, you know, and a lot of jobs. And I talked about this in the last one, you know, you turn it on 500 applicants, you know, within four days. So there's a lot of competition too. Absolutely. Yeah. I yep. think that's like the first thing that you figure out once you're here in yeah. industry that like, like these are just like people right they <laughs> got their like, own issues uh, yeah, they're trying they're to like figure totally, out their way they totally normal they like know some stuff that you don't but like you probably know some stuff that like you don't and like they just want to figure things out and like right. most people i feel like don't have an ego <laughs> about right. that kind of thing um so what advice would you give someone looking to get their first job as a game designer right now like what are your thoughts in 2024 here? Very different than 2009, but yeah, I like deep sigh, right? I, I think it's it's really hard right now, right? Just to like say that up front, like yeah. I think it's uh, a weird the, time. 2024 yeah. has been like just a rough year. It's like March, right? <laughs> right. I feel if you're on LinkedIn at all, it's just kind of like it feels like everybody's going through an existential crisis <laughs> all, right. at, yeah. all at once yeah. and like trying to like hang together and and right. and stuff. And I think that that environment can it probably seems really scary, right, to yeah. people who are trying to like break in. And you know, on top of all the other feelings you have, like I just talked about, like you know, the environment wasn't like that when I was getting a job, and I still felt those feelings of like this is impossible and I'm inadequate. Posture like, syndrome and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely, right. It's like a cliche, but it's totally true, and it's like hard to like logic yourself out of like a thing you didn't really logic yourself into, right? It's just like right. a thing that you have. I think like the advice that I would give is that. <laughs> this is like worked for me. Like I said, it took me like 14 years to to break <laughs> to the commercial like game like industry. Right, AAA, yeah. And I think that like it really helps to try as much as you can to have like a long view of like your career. Mm -hmm. Like some of the best uh, advice that I, or at least the advice that I like think about the most was like in the early aughts <laughs> when, I, early when aughts, I graduated right. high school. There was like a commencement speech the author Neil Gaiman gave. I forget where, hmm. um, but he talked about how like you should think of the thing that you want to do <laughs> as right. like a mountain. And then you think of the decisions that you make along your career, which will take years, are either going to take you like closer to that mountain or farther away. So right. you don't need to get like the thing immediately. You just try to like do things that are commiserate to you, like building skills and eventually getting that thing. So right. for me... That was learning to work with teams, learning unity, <laughs> learning to lead teams, like building up skills that like were relevant. Like as soon as I walked in the door at Level X, I like didn't feel like I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> right. You know, where like places I could kind of plug in, I could see where I could like add value and help and, and do all that stuff. And like mm -hmm. joining Insomniac was very much the same. It's kind of like if you learn software development for immersive simulations, serious games, whatever you want to call it, it like yep. has a ton of commonalities. <laughs> so yeah. like as, as you are building those skills, like you're going to be good. And the hardest thing to like hear now is probably just that like that might take a year. <laughs> it might right. take longer, right? It's like the industry trends are weird and like they change and mm -hmm. you don't know what's going to go on like with your life. Like something might happen. You have, might have to put plans on hold. So just like, Right. Having that long term <laughs> kind right. of philosophy of like whatever happens to me, I like know kind of like where I'm going it is going to be like good for you, like in the long run. Yeah. Having kind of like that North Star and just kind of knowing what direction you're pointing and making your decisions based on that and not getting anxious or beating yourself up like, well, why am I not a creative director right now you know it's yeah like, All right, I, this is I think going. like another part of that for me at least was like figuring out what are the things that you like about making games your life's goal probably isn't to have a job at like x studio like yeah. maybe it is but it's like 
it should maybe be like I want to solve the best problems, right? I like making games because I like telling stories, right? I like like working mm-hmm. with teams to be energized and like working on the same problems. Yeah. And if you can kind of boil it down to like what those essential things are, there are ways to kind of like satisfy <laughs> those right. creative holes in you that aren't necessarily tied to a specific title or a specific studio or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that is also helpful. So for the years and years that I wasn't working at a game studio who made games that people could actually play. Spider-Man, or, right? Everyone's yeah, yeah. I, I like made stuff for myself or like I did yeah. game games with friends. I just did it all the time because I wanted to learn and because I couldn't do anything like that during like my my day job. So I was lucky mm-hmm. in I was learning the skills. I didn't have to sit down in front of YouTube and learn how to do Unity. I got right, paid right. to do that part. But right. then, like, weekends, I could make a game where you could go through dungeons or a cool narrative card game or something like that. Mm. The other part about that <laughs> is that if you do the thing that I did, which, like, I don't know if I recommend that you do, but it is possible, <laughs> yeah. you will need those examples to actually bolster your portfolio. That was, like, the hardest lesson that I had to mm-hmm. learn. <laughs> which right. is that even though I was making 3D content in Unity, I learned how to do all the stuff, <laughs> like unwrap and render out things and, and make models and do hard surface stuff mostly. And I right. applied to Bioware in 2010. <laughs> and I was like, it was the first real game studio that I applied to. And I got mm-hmm. the feedback from them. It's great that they even gave me feedback <laughs> looking back. Mm -hmm. Where they're like, your portfolio doesn't have relevant examples. It's like, and our recommendation is that you build game assets that people could visualize like being in games, you know, not just like, Right. Like That's army good vehicles and stuff. And that was right. soul crushing for me because at the time, the way I thought of it was, oh, I'm wasting my time like at my day job and it's not getting me closer to that goal. But mm. it really, I should have taken that advice for what it was, which was just like incredibly useful. <laughs> yeah, very much. Uh, of, hey, this is the next thing that you need to be doing. Like make these types of things and showcase this type of work. Mm. Um, well, that's great advice, too, because, like, you know, anyone who listens to this podcast is like, oh, he's going to go on this rant again. But it's like, yeah, <laughs> doing more than just the bare minimum and doing stuff outside of school or outside of work and doing game jams and working with people and having this stuff in your portfolio. There's nothing more discouraging than just seeing a resume with no link to anything and nothing to play, nothing to see, especially for game design. It's like... I want to see stuff, right? What have you done? Even if it's small projects, you, you know, that should be on the resume. Like you don't get a job in game design just based on a document. People want to see yeah. stuff. So it's smart that you did that. I think like the the do things outside of work or school or, or whatever is like critical. And I think like the the part that will make that make sense to you and your brain, <laughs> the proverbial you, you yeah. who's listening to this podcast is like, do something that you legitimately actually care about and that excites you. I think right. there's always that conventional advice where it's like, if you're doing a personal project, there's this super emphasis on finaling and finishing stuff and make sure you mm-hmm. scope it so it's small and you can like do that. My biggest solo projects that I love the most are things that are unfinished and they languish, but but it gave me things to talk about that I loved. And I think that that is like an incredible skill. Like if you go into an interview and you're going to talk about the work that you've done, if you can summon that feeling and like get it across that you were like doing this because you actually like it and Mm -hmm. you're excited (laughs) and like that excitement is what's driving you to solve problems and put stuff together. Honestly, that is like, I think like more valuable than having like a bunch of, you know, the same kind of like small games that ever, that YouTube teaches you how to do and stuff. Right. So like, even if you don't finish it, I think like game jams are really good (laughs) for Mm -hmm. creating like a a window where you will finish something and that's good. And that will teach you some of those skills. But if you want like a long-term project, that is just like the thing that you think about, right. When you're at your day job, like that is, valuable because that will kind of drive you to develop not just that but like learning how to talk to people about the project that you're doing Mm -hmm. if you can again convey that sense of this is why i like game design like this is what makes me really excited about like you said like your craft i think that is the probably like the secondary to what you said like do Mm -hmm. stuff out of work but have it be something you actually like doing too yeah because that way you know, it motivates you and because it doesn't feel like such drudgery and you're like, you know, you come home from school at work and you're like, oh, I got to do that thing. And it's just, oh, it's terrible. I'm just going to watch Netflix, you know, but if it's something you're excited about, 
then you're going to work on it more and you work on it more, then you're going to learn more things and you're going to be able to interview better and you're going to have passion and passion is a component of interviewing it. So, you know, it's all this like kind of links together. Um, so it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think yeah. like, and also this is the last thing I'll say on this, but like, sure. Try to surround yourself with people who do that too. I think mm -hmm. that's really valuable. Having adjacent peers who are doing the same thing. I remember that was something that really impressed me about the culture of Level X was that you're allowed to work on side projects. Yeah, and very much. The first event outside of work that I went to is I think like an IGDA thing, but they were projecting Billy's game on the wall. <laughs> right. uh, that was that's like the coolest thing I've ever seen. Right. There's just the, all these people who do these great things during the work day mm -hmm. and they're making like great things, things that are like legitimately cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then they're also doing these like other weird kind of side projects that are awesome. I think it comes out in June. We're talking about Billy Basso and his game Animal Well, right? Animal, Animal Well. Talk about ambitious. Like he wrote his own engine, yeah, was designed his own piece, game, right? <laughs> did the sound of like literally like the one person band. Stuff that people used to do 40, 30 <laughs> years ago, like he's doing it all himself. And um, it, it just seems to work. I worked with Billy at Phosphor Games. I worked with him at Level X. Uh, awesome, interesting, talented guy. And it's just exciting to see that this game's coming out. And, you know, we encourage that, especially back in olden times and at different studios. It'd be like, you can't work on stuff outside of work. You know, the joke used to be the CEO would be like at Midway, say, I own your dreams, right? Like you can't... <laughs> You can't do anything, but it's like, well, if you work on stuff outside of work and you get better at Unity and you get better at art, you get better at design, then that bleeds in your yeah. day job. So it's it's a win-win. As long as you're not stealing tech or trying to compete or whatever, encourage that. Like, why would you not encourage that? Again, it's, you know, it rolls into your your work and it, it's better for everybody. So I've never understood, you know, when people got weird about that and you had to sign NDAs and you can't do anything outside of work and stuff, you know, we're are all artists at different levels. So like encourage the muse and let people do stuff and not just beat that down. Yeah. Um, and it's like, and people are developing themselves for free. <laughs> yeah. Right. What about game designers right now trying to advance their career? You know, they're two, four, six, eight years into their career. Like what kind of advice for those here trying to go to the next level would you share? Yeah, I think like it's difficult for me to know like what the normal trajectory for a game designer is. <laughs> but I'll say that for me, I very early on at Delight Digital and other jobs, we called it their task lead. I've also heard it called like a pod lead. Like that's the terminology we use, like hmm. at Insomniac. I think okay. like learning to be like an effective leader of teams is like a really good skill and one that I maybe wouldn't have like necessarily aligned to game design when I was interested in game design and starting this. I think there's a couple of reasons for this where like design specifically is sort of the natural kind of like crux <laughs> and center point right. like a feature at a lot of times. So you find yourself just doing a lot of kind of ad hoc communication you're either working very closely with like a producer or a PM or in smaller mm -hmm. teams I've seen, like maybe that role doesn't exist and it's just you, like the designer. Right. Yeah. And I think the things that I love the most and the teams that I've seen work the most effectively are the ones where you have a designer who is kind of at the center rallying the team. And mm -hmm. that works through maintaining, it, this is especially like hard, but valuable in like remote <laughs> work. Yeah, especially, right. At reaching out, to people async to see like what they need running this will sound like super basic but it's really important like can you run a stand-up and can you get people talking to each other right <laughs> So it's not just dictating down, hey guys, like I figured out, I think what like our biggest challenges are, and this is how I think we should tackle them. Uh, I have like a design director who gave me incredible advice, which was that, hey, I need you every day to get on this, <laughs> to run this meeting mm -hmm. and get, make the debate for what the next most important thing to do in the game or the feature, mm -hmm. make that happen. Have everyone play the game and then like make that debate happen and then have everyone decide what to do. And that is like so clear <laughs> and specific, but the skills that you, that to make actually make that happen are like, 
not things that I had like out of the right. box. You don't learn that in sc- school, right? Like, yeah, right. It's like that. This isn't writing a design doc, and this right. is it's not a GDD. Like, what is it? Yeah, yeah, we talk about like communication a lot of times. That is like you know pitching and still these sort mm. of formal rituals, but like right. yeah, rallying folks and having not just prescriptive answers, but saying, hey, this is my perspective of like what I. Th- think like the big problem is let's Mm. kind of talk about that to each other i think that's like super super valuable (laughs) yeah because so much about game development is communication and what are you thinking this is what i'm thinking and what should we do here and you know getting people to talk and figure out solutions and not having all the disciplines in their little silos and just going doing this right like it's like yeah herding cats right let's as a producer former producer i was always the jokes like you're trying to herd cats mm-hmm. get people pointed in the same direction and working on the right stuff and not gold plating stuff and just doing stuff that they want to do but going towards a goal yeah mm-hmm. it's kind of like can we all talk about this so that we all one have a common understanding of what the thing is but then right. two can we feel like we have a stake in this right like it's not just me it's not just right. design telling everyone what to do it's like mm-hmm. We've got this team. So we like are working in, uh, we do kind of like a pod structure. So you have like a mm-hmm. small multiple disciplinary group of, it could be as small as like five people or. Okay. Di- in multiple, yeah. Artist, designer, programmer. Right. Yeah. And then it's that group might do just, so for like Spider Man 2, like just the open world collectibles or something like that. Right. Um, and or like just a boss fight. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's like you get to work with like that small group of people and communication should be great. <laughs> Because it's so small, no, right? Like, yeah, you could just fit everyone in a room. And everyone could like say what their opinion is and stuff. And yeah. sometimes it doesn't happen, right? Like if you get hardcore into production and then it just becomes this exercise of I'm going to sit in my corner in remote times. So I'm going to stare at my Jiro window <laughs> like, <laughs> right. through the tickets and stuff. Right. And, and just like having that ability to kind of like, can we make this still feel like we're a group of people talking about what the best solution is? And, right. and the reason I think that that's like a good skill that design should do is because i think the (laughs) you don't want to have to be the person who is in charge of everything and that can happen (laughs) if you don't sort of build that sense of self-sufficiency within a team you want people Mm -hmm. to be like looking for targets and self-sufficient and know where they're going so that they can see things and grab them and we're all together i think what can happen and what i see happen sometimes with more junior designers Mm -hmm. is that if you don't put in the work (laughs) to kind of that that sensibility in that team then it's just you doing everything right and kind of like reaching out to departments when you need to and they're put in kind of a very passive place because they're just like waiting to be fed because they're not like what's going on right it's like i'm sure you've seen this like as a producer you can have like people were very talented be kind of put in a position where through lack of context they are not acting like seniors anymore and it's not because they're mm-hmm. bad employees it's just because they're like oh i guess this is the way <laughs> we're gonna right. gonna work through this problem or whatever right yeah and, and if i if i'm not in power and if i don't try and do different stuff i'm just wasting my time or someone's gonna say something so i will just throttle back and just be passive yeah it's like i don't get to know why this is important so it's not my problem so i'm just gonna be told like what to do and when and i'll wait for someone to kind of ping me with that information and then that just drags on right like you know i I remember reading a quote, quote recently that was just saying you know nothing great is done without passion, you know, so there's got to be that spark, that thing that you're excited about. And when people come up collectively with solutions, they feel more ownership, they're more engaged, they want to see it through then versus just someone dictating it down and just do the thing, do the thing and, you know, open it Jira and like, oh, I guess this is what I'm doing, you know, so um, yeah, how to foster that communication and that collaboration, I think is key. And we kind of touched on this before around communication, but what do you feel the most important quality or skill for other designers is to have? Yeah, I think being a good communicator is definitely top of my list somewhere mm-hmm. in, in the top. I think you sort of alluded to it when we were talking about getting jobs in the industry, about being able to how like being able to write a design document. Like, isn't it? Right. I think more and more we're seeing that that's just not the trend. Like, right. The 400-page like, no, like, GDD like we used to right? do in old times. Like, 
<laughs> Nobody reads that. Yeah, but yeah, I did. And so then you get mad at people GDD. for not reading it, right? right? Like, it's on page 278. What, what are you talking about? Because no one read the Nobody GDD. Nobody reads that. <laughs> yeah, so I think like the being a good communicator, and that doesn't just mean, I think documentation is a part of it. I think that documentation has a really important place in that place, especially in a remote world, if there's different time right. zones. The documentation is your proxy when you can't be available to like answer right. questions. Right. And but I think that like understanding that like you're you have a role as a facilitator of information. So maybe it's a confluence page or the yeah. similar to a GDD and that lives there forever so we can see it like in perpetuity. Right. And it gets updated. But when you're, yeah. Yeah, but when you're like pitching the team, maybe that's a deck, right? Or a mirror right, that right, you right. can through or something. More digestible. So kind of like, yeah. Yeah, probably like the more pithy way to understand that is understand who the audience for any kind of like communication right. is. So point. it's like, is it going to be like, do I have a mode for this information for someone who wants to know literally everything and has like an hour to pour into it? Right. Am I in a am I in a half hour meeting where I have fifteen minutes to like go through this content and it's kind of like a mixed department thing? Is this to my game director? Right. right. And I think yeah. all three of those <laughs> would be mm -hmm. like different in terms of the degree of information and what you focus on and stuff. So that's communication for sure. And then this is gonna sound cheesy maybe, but like no, I okay. think empathy like, that's yeah. like a hot button word, but it is super true i think mm -hmm. like game development is hard and you don't always know all of the pieces there's the resource things you don't have right. like access to people all the time and then just being able to like kind of try to understand <laughs> for me a thing that was really hard for me for many years like in my career and i still struggle with is just knowing, accepting the fact that I don't know what's happening, what's going on with another person. Mm -hmm. I, uh, like, yeah, right. One of the best pieces of coaching that Jason gave me when I was at Level X was, I was like having a hard time with a rough interaction, <laughs> like yeah. on a project. And I was sort of telling him what was happening. And I was like, I was doing this, and this other person was doing this, and they did this because of this. And he was like, something I want to push back on you on is, you'll like fill in the gaps of things you don't know with what you think. <laughs> like, oh, right. Not, yeah. just, I think it's just because we're as humans, there's like such a compelling draw to like create a narrative. Mm -hmm. So I'll be like, yeah. And then they cancel this meeting probably because they thought I shouldn't be on, you know, like that. Right. Kind of, it was like, try not to do that. Like, even just mm -hmm. as like, you're explaining the story like back. Cause like, you don't, you can't possibly know what they were right. thinking like in that moment and all you're doing <laughs> yeah. is like kind of editorializing and creating this new reality that might mm -hmm. not exist and you're getting worked up about it right and that was like it sounds super basic but that was like i think about that <laughs> all yeah. the time like you don't know what people think so you have to believe what they tell you you have to mm -hmm. like take them at their word and you have to like look at the things they do and that's the information <laughs> and i think a big part of that for me is rooted in empathy just this idea that i don't need to square it in my head and i don't need to root it in like my emotional reaction to something because my right. emo reaction to a thing isn't always the most important thing and is often rarely <laughs> like the important right. thing feels very big uh, and present for me, but like in many instances, especially earlier in my career, that kind of got in my way a little bit. Like when I was trying mm -hmm. to work for something, just like having an inability or an unwillingness to, to do the thing that he was asking me to do, which is just like maybe remove that part. Yeah. Try to guess what's going on. Just like take take the information you have and make a, a, a decision based on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like don't make assumptions, right? Because yeah. you don't know what's going on. And then you start filling in that narrative and it you kind of spin in your head. And it's um, the thing, it's like, oh, this probably happened because people hate me, you know? It's right, like, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, and you can even have a hypothesis of what it is, but like, no, like, I shouldn't be doing that. I'm going to step back and just see how this all thing goes. And then later you're like, oh, that was, I was jumping the gun. That wasn't true. And not just like, well, that's this, this a, you, you know. Right, or um, just like understand where it's coming from too, yeah. right? It's like, oh, I'm having an effective response to this. And that's kind of coloring the thing right. that I think or feel. Because I want it to make sense to me. That was very actionable for me. And I do it all the time now. <laughs> going yeah. Forward. No, that's cool. And that's cool advice. And it, it kind of bleeds in this next question. But, you know, what's your advice for 
about developing interpersonal skills, Q, EQ, core skills, you know, that kind of stuff. I think like it's very easy to empathize with people with whom we share like similarities, you know, but which right. I mean, other have, game designers or yeah, stuff like yeah, that, totally. Yeah. Or, you know, you have hobbies in common or you right. come from the same part of the, the country, like things like that age, like, you know, yeah. these things. And I think where it becomes harder to like build empathy is where you don't immediately feel that kind of like kinship with somebody, right. which is like super normal. I think yeah. it's like, that's fair. Not a failing, I think, at all, as long right. as we sort of understand that you just need to do things to build that up. So one right. thing, one super practical thing that you can do uh, is like have one-on-ones with peers, people that you work with. Um, uh -huh. This is a thing that I also didn't know, or I didn't do this before I came to Level X. And there's mm -hmm. like such a culture of one-on-ones -on right. in Level X. I had like one-on-ones with like every designer before I was like in a people management role. It was just like, oh, we should talk once a week. Right. right? And it's See what's great. Going on. And, and having like that time scheduled, recurring on whatever cadence like makes sense based on like your role and their role or people's yeah, time. schedules and stuff. Yeah. yeah. But like having, this is the key, I think, Regularly scheduled, no agenda. You, it can mm, have an agenda right. sometimes, but I think like leaving those gaps to be like, oh, what games did you play? What did you do on the weekend? Like having sort of that space where you can kind of like talk and like learn about each other mm -hmm. is super important. And that is the right. part that I felt like just went away like in remote times. Like that would yeah. happen normal style, like in the kitchen or just in the elevator or whenever. Like another. Right thing about level x is that people were like always hanging out just like in the periphery yeah <laughs> hanging out in the kitchen area like having a drink right? at, at six o'clock right and like yeah hey, what are you working on what's going sometimes on sometimes yeah. earlier you know right right <laughs> like it was very everyone was just like very chill and it was easy to get to know people and people are fascinating so it's like fun to get to know people i think this thing of have a one-on-one -on -one, try not to cancel it because i think the impulse <laughs> especially when people are busy and people are always right busy, yeah oh, i don't no have agenda. anything to talk uh, to right yeah, yeah i don't have anything to talk about. about this week let's just like we'll give you the time back it's like i think there's a ton of value in keeping those as often as you can just right. so that you have that opportunity to kind of like build somewhere and then once you do it, it becomes a billion times easier to like relate to people to give them the benefit of the doubt when things happen but I think it like it starts with like how do we meaningfully build relationships with each other in in this brave new world and I'll right. say one thing this is like a trick that I learned <laughs> cool. from I don't like I remember like Nick he was a producer like on the client team yeah this is something that he did to me once and it like blew my mind <laughs> Hi, if you're finding this helpful, please like and subscribe so the YouTube algorithms know and I can help share it with more people. Thanks. Like he and I were having not like a hard time, but it was just like a tense time, like in the mm -hmm. project. And I, I could feel myself becoming like less and less charitable. <laughs> <laughs> nice way. <laughs> Towards him, and it was just like you know, not because of probably not honestly, probably not because of anything he was doing, but just because like when you get stressed, it's like I am becoming more critical of everything I'm seeing and hearing. Yeah, all right, from yeah. you. Like, the gloves he, come like, out. Yeah, 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 and he did this thing which I think was fascinating, where he like asked if he we could sync. Like it was like after work, it was like five thirty or something. So like yeah. you know, work hours ish, but yeah. there's like nothing else was going on. And then he just he said like, hey, I just wanted to like catch up with you and i wanted to ask if you were comfortable giving me any feedback on like how i'm doing like this week and i did and, yeah. and but it completely took away all my defenses and i just wow. felt like and then i was like do you want to give feedback <laughs> me <laughs> no it's like all right right which i go. feel like was perhaps maybe his real not the handle. Right. Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. Right. Like it's okay. probably it's you much, reciprocate much this. friendlier to, to ask right. like, hey, like, hey, give me feedback on like how this is going. And right. just like asking for that instead of being like, yo, like what's your problem? Yeah, with me? You, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. I because it's a way to diffuse it, right? You diffuse yeah, it by like getting like, the dialogue isn't that, going. Isn't that stuff. phenomenal? Isn't that crazy? What yeah. the yeah, no, that mind trick. That is yeah. super cool. It's like, I, I love that. Yep. <laughs> I like, like talk wait, about man. that in interviews all the time where I'm like, that's like the wildest thing that's ever, because I totally went in there being like, I have a, a list of things I want to talk about to this guy. <laughs> 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 right?
And then I said all that stuff to, I gave him like some of my list, but I definitely coached it in a, a friendlier way. And then I right. like felt offering him things where I was like, also, I know that I've been doing this and that could maybe be better, but it, right. cause it, was, yeah, it yeah. was like, it activated the empathy part of my brain, which is like not always super like right, right. there and like present. So yeah. I, uh, that was amazing. I, and I think about that. So pivoting here, like what's been one or two of your favorite games or projects to work on? I think one has to be, even though it was like very, very short, my engagement in it, uh, the like grant work that I did when I was with you guys for Trish, like NASA. Yes, um, right. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's they, NASA, right? Like, damn, yeah, these it, astronauts have triple PhDs. I was like, it's crazy. Yeah, it's just like phenomenal. Just like the the number, the sheer number of subject matter experts who we talked to and just like the different people from like behavior were like different from the people who were like more medically inclined and there were people who were, had tours on the ISS and things like that. It was a joy to learn. Being at Level X is always just about like trying to learn as much as you can about something you have no idea about right, like, right. very quickly. And I think there are a few things as fascinating, honestly, as space and the things that like happen to your body. Your body, right. right. How <laughs> your body changes in space and microgravity. What does that mean when you have medical yeah. emergencies? Because like mm -hmm. your organs are doing good because it's not supposed to be up there. Different shapes slightly different places. Yeah. And yeah. It's like, it's the worst. It's like, who wants to do that? It's crazy. Right. <laughs> and then also just the challenge of it, you know, you, know, you get like tens of millions of people playing Spider-Man 2. I remember when we were talking through the ultrasound stuff that like Thu was doing they're like well we know how many people are in the current class of astronauts and it's like i think single digits right, right, right. Like going for so tens of millions versus like eight right, right. <laughs> like we know who they are we can if you want we can like scan their bodies and you can get like their physical physiology like <laughs> it's just, like the proposed thing right it's like well yeah if you want to do training do you want to do it like literally on your crew members physiology it's like you probably should they will be the people up in that right. like and like with you having the so emergency just like yeah i think like that having that getting to have that experience just because it is it's still game design and it's still solving problems, but it's just like problems that are not really like <laughs> anything else. Uh, right. which is amazing. And then I remember like, I forget what they were called, but it's like every quarter or so we would do a big presentation for that group to say like, Hey, here's what the progress was. Right. Um, and I remember the first time I got, uh, called to like present the anatomy portion of that. Mm. Um, and I, I like did it. I felt like I nailed it. It was like the stuff the team had produced was like incredibly good. The content was really great. We were getting right. really good feedback from like that cohort. The call ended. I like hung up and I literally like cried <laughs> like at my desk. <laughs> because, like I think it, we've talked about this before. It's like I came to Level X after a longish period of unemployment, <laughs> which is rough. Mm. I think a lot of people are going yeah, it's now. tough psychologically, right? And I remember, and I like pitching to clients, being able to talk about design, being animated about it. It's like one of the things that I always felt like I was really good at. <laughs> right. And it made me feel like, uh, I don't know, it's just like something I love doing. And there was like this stretch of time where I was like, you know, I finished that call and I hung up and I was like, I like, there, I didn't think I was going to get to do this. <laughs> right. <laughs> Anymore and just having that feeling of having and doing it on this, right? Where it was like right. NASA, NASA like, right? Yeah, yeah. This team that was like so cool. And I was just like, oh, thank God. <laughs> I'm, right. so, I'm so I glad I got, to, yeah, I got to have this experience. It was a short amount of time for me, but mm. it was like really meaningful. I think it just was like the right thing for me to do at the, at the right time <laughs> yeah. when I needed it. And then, you know, my second project, I think, has to be like Spider Man 2, just because right. it. It, it's like wait, literally, is it 50 million did i read 50 million games or something I, it, it's so I, like insane I don't know. <laughs> numbers the, the metacritic number, is 90 or something like, yeah just, right oh which is like the, the high, i know like you shouldn't care about the score and stuff like that but it's just from the aspect of like just the energy in the studio right yeah. i think it's 
the highest reviewed game in 20 years or something that I no, heard. That's insane. Like Spyro Year of the Dragon, I think, was like the last one it breached to like 90. Before I was at Insomniac, I was a fan of them. So just seeing their trajectory is right. like so cool of, you know, Spider Man 2018 and then like Miles and then this. And like truly, honestly, I do believe that each of those games is like learning from the successes and like taking in feedback from fans and just like watching us get better. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. It's some really cool, like to see it from the announcement trailer for Spider Man 2, like came out at that state of play or summer whatever showcase the week I was interviewing with them. So oh. I remember watching it and being like, oh my God, like, right. wow. <laughs> that's going to be wild. Yeah. yeah. But it's crazy. It's a totally wild. Like, this will be the first game I've shipped. This is the first game I've shipped. <laughs> right. You know, I'm on Moby Games now. It's just this. <laughs> it's a wild experience to have. It kind of feels like, oh, weird. It's the first one, like, right out the gate. But then also, it, you know, I'm 36. <laughs> I have, like, worked doing, making yeah. stuff a long time, like, before this. So it, right. I'm actually in this space of, like, am I early or late? Like, it doesn't even really matter at this no. point. That, right. You're yeah, going up the I, mountain, right? You're pointing in that right? direction. You're I, going up the mountain. And <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and two things is think about that. People that say they don't care about Metacritic or they don't care about sales. Yeah. I don't know if I believe you. Right. Like, cause <laughs> I worked on Mortal Kombat for eight years and it was like, we wanted to be number one. And, and, mm -hmm. and it was always like, Oh, GTA is coming out. We got to get up for GTA, you know, cause GTA would just suck the air out of the game industry because it was such an event, you know? So like we didn't do it at Deadly Alliance. We didn't hit number one, but on Deception we did. And I remember seeing that uh, NPD report, which is video game sales. And I like, we fucking hit number one. Like we did it, <laughs> right? And I printed yeah. it and I highlighted it and I put it on my office door. I'm like, you know, we did it, right? Like that was, you know, a big deal. So people say they don't care about that. I'm like... I don't know if I buy that. And then the other thing, too, it's like Metacritic is great, but I worked on a game, uh, Incubation Time is Running Out, and won turn-based strategy Game of the Year award. We beat out XCOM back in 1998. And everyone I talked to, all 5,000 people, because nobody bought the damn game, you know, loved it, but, like, that's the problem. Nobody bought the game, and the studio yeah. closed and moved to Austin. So it's like you had that satisfaction of knowing everyone that played it loved it and that it was so well-reviewed, but nobody bought it too and um maybe i'm going against my indie music scene creed or whatever but like the fact that it has an impact that millions of people play it means something right it's, it's not yeah. just trivializing and like oh i'm pure indie i don't care about that <laughs> whatever you know it's like there, there's something cool about just like having that impact on millions of people's I think lives like, you know? absolutely and for something like i think mortal kombat's probably in this vein too but for a license like a franchise like spider-man there's yeah. just like before we're even involved in it that means so much to to certain mm -hmm. people right yeah and so knowing that it's like oh god the, like you're like the steward of this thing people have a lot kind of invested and they like care about it and right. like you know, these characters have been with people from, you know, childhood. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to watch uh, it in the 80s, like the cartoon, I mean, late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, late 70s, early 80s, right? Like yeah. uh, the Green Goblin I, flying around and shit, like, yeah. you know. The thing that has changed me, it, like, working on that game is, like, I was definitely one of those. I was sort of, sort of joking, but sort of serious, the, like, oh, you shouldn't care about Metacritic. That's, like, definitely what I thought. I remember thinking that, like, during development. But, I don't know, like, critical reception is more important than, like, sales and the broadest art is also the most popular art in the Metacritic kind of scheme. Yeah, yeah. There's, but then it's like when the reviews were coming out and they were good. Yeah, like really <laughs> and good. Then it like, and then it was like, you know, we're sitting at 90 and it's like when it looked like it might drop lower, <laughs> I felt right, like, that I did care. <laughs> like, right. I was like, like, oh no, oh what's Kotaku going to say? No, are they going to slam us? <laughs> Right. So then I was like, oh, and that's just like something you don't know until you feel it in your soul where I was like, oh, yeah. you know, like I do actually really want to, I yeah. want like, I want this to be like well received. I want like people to like it. Like I know it's a good game and I'm really proud of it. And like a lot of the team is like too, right. but yeah, I think having that 
It's not even about like validation. One thing I never really understood was the, you know, like React videos that try, is this some oh, like, right, yeah. like some old, sorry guys, like it, <laughs> that trend okay. of you just watch a video of someone reacting to like a thing. And I was like, this yeah. is like, I don't get it. But then I watched streamer reacts to parts of the game or the, the gameplay trailer that we did that showed the whole like lizard chase and mm -hmm. just seeing people like freak out or get like emotional. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's just something I can't help but be affected by it. You're like, this rules. I just want, I like want the people who want to love this to love it, <laughs> you know? Right. Like, yeah. It's like, I think a lot of times it can feel there's this kind of like tension, right, between like developers and like mm -hmm. gamers and, and not always like aligned. But it's truly, honestly, I don't know a developer who isn't just making these things because they want people <laughs> right. to like love them. Right. I really always do hope that people will like get something from right. from the experience and that they're going to like have fun and that something is going to like grab them and they're going to like, you know, yeah, like really right. like. <laughs> connect with it connect you know? with it and have an emotional response to it right and exactly like, yeah <laughs> and, and i think the real pinnacle of that is when you f you feel something like i want to do this and you have a positive reaction to it you know like we used to sit in fatality meetings and ed would stick figure stuff and if it got a reaction out of people that was kind of like yeah let's do that you know we would laugh about it because like if we're laughing about it other people are going to laugh about it or find it entertaining and then when you do it and other people do it kind of validates those decisions you made and that kind of vision you had. So yeah. it, it's, it's like a weird, like, I think this is cool. I think other people like it. And when they really like it, then you're like, I'm not crazy. Other people yeah. like this and it validates that I impulse you like, had, right? That's uh, like totally a weird thing about games too, right? Where you have to live in that space of not knowing for so long. <laughs> yeah. And it's uncomfortable, right? Like yeah. find fun. Like what the fuck does that mean? Like make I, it fun, like right? Like, part of the, the uh, value of having incredible creative directors are just like the people who like are like, no, I know this mm -hmm. is going to work and you have to trust me. Right. <laughs> right. And like just that. let's go out in this limb together. Yeah. And, and two years from now, mm -hmm. we'll see it come to fruition right like but yeah just totally like yeah that's that's i think you put your finger on it for me which is that like the fatality thing and having people react well it's like yeah if you i watch a video of someone playing a beat and they like laugh at the joke at the point <laughs> where we want them to i'm like right like, <laughs> right, right, like, like, okay yeah <laughs> like, it wasn't crickets <laughs> could he, could he, could he? Like, yeah right. or they like yeah they shout and kiss something with awesome or they yeah it's mm -hmm. you're just like yes yes okay cool we weren't like totally wrong <laughs> right yeah right because there was that self-doubt in the back and now it's like no i was just being overly critical this was mm -hmm. right my heart was in the true place and it, it did come through um just kind of pivoting here, like, what are you curious about right now in the game industry? One thing that I'm sort of perpetually curious about is, like, what is going to happen with live service? Like, I feel like that oh, model yeah. is, mm -hmm. like, shifting all the time. And I feel mm -hmm. like for a while, we, it's sort of, I don't know, this probably just happens in, like, waves, right? And it sort right. of feels like, okay, we're all wise to, like, whatever is going on. So it's, okay, loot boxes, like, right, right. kind of figured out that that wasn't great. Yep. Be just that, like, it worked better when people didn't understand it. <laughs> right. And, and now people kind of grow, like, resistances to it, or they figure out what the value for, like, their money is, and that's sort of, like, battle pass, and different things happen all the time. And right. then you see these really big titles kind of come and go to various like responses and for me the reason i started thinking about this again was the reception that like helldivers 2 has got mm -hmm. i love when something like that happens where it, it kind of felt like it came out of nowhere for a lot right. of people i know that first game has like its fan base and people are very passionate about it mm -hmm. but just all of my gaming groups that like, i play were like simultaneously into helldivers at the same time and i love that yeah yeah <laughs> That kind of like something that didn't have the benefit of a huge marketing cycle or even a franchise title that, you know, would bring people in otherwise. Yeah. And people are just like resonating with it like so hard and it's so memeable and there's so much, <laughs> like, you know, like Instagram reels and like TikToks of just these moments. It, it almost just feels like a comedy game, like at times, and it makes mm -hmm. you feel really smart and funny for having these moments that are kind of like procedurally authored in the game right. in like the best possible way. So I, I really like how that has come in and sort of like lit people's brains on fire. I wonder, mm -hmm. the thing I'm curious about is like, I wonder what 
what lessons we're going to take from that. <laughs> what about that is like replicable? I think because yeah. again, it's like that model. It's a tough one, right? It's hard to yeah. figure what's going to work. <laughs> what's going right. to work? Yeah. For- what's going to work for devs what isn't going to seem this isn't serving like anyone's needs and the games aren't really like resonating with people and i think just to yeah to have that hell divers too where people are like this rules it's fun i'm having fun haven't like heard anyone really talk about the monetization of it like and Mm -hmm. and with like complaints or anything like that so at a minimum it's palatable right it's like leading into the background for some folks um Mm -hmm. yeah so i think that's an interesting thing to ponder yeah it's kind of like it's kind of like lightning in a bottle. Like there's something about that. Like I, I haven't played it yet because I'm terrible about that kind of stuff sometimes. But like, do you play multiplayer games or not a lot? No, yeah. I, I tend to do stuff more on mobile and just single player on a computer and stuff. But I hear a lot about it. So you know, for me to hear a lot about it, like okay, wow, there's something going on. Yeah, there. yeah. So um, that's cool. What about potential threats and opportunities? I mean, you kind of touched on that a little bit with life services, but like anything you're concerned about or like what the f's going on besides uh, I, the obvious so said so threats and opportunities i kind of have a blended answer like a yeah. both. opportunities for me the biggest one for sure is the remote work trends that we saw mm-hmm. kind of pop up like during the pandemic right that's super valuable i think in terms of having access to a broader talent base for anything yeah, very like, much so. super super biased because i Probably, I, I could never work here <laughs> at Insomniac if I had to relocate to, like, West right. Coast. And, you know, for a long time, probably, like, when I was in my 20s and trying really hard to, like, dream about the game industry and stuff, yeah, I would have done anything, I think. Right. But, like, right. life changes. <laughs> my son was born two years ago, and then that became kind of a thing where, we were, well, do we want to live near his extended family or my parents, you right. know, yeah, yeah, my like important. friends and my support system is on the East Coast, which right. is a plane ride away when we were in Chicago and would be an even worse plane ride away right. if we were on the West Coast. So it's like, it would evolve. And I think this is obviously true of everyone, not just me, I'm the only person to ever have a child. <laughs> <laughs> like, and before, you know, remote work was possible, it's sort of like you have to make that decision of where are like my values at this point in my life even right. having the opportunity to say oh well i get to you know we were talking i i think maybe before we started recording about how everybody from the midwest has worked at the same couple of studios in the chicago area it's like because right. yeah those are your options if you don't want to like move right right we're gonna stay here like, you had to do that yeah and i think that this is being able to up in that like model. And I think it also gives you access to different people, right? Like there are like insomniacs who have aging parents and want to live close to them. Or I remember even when I was at level X, I forget who, but we were interviewing somebody who was just talking about how like I left the industry for a really long time for that situation. Cause I had right. to go take care of my dad and I never thought that I'd be able to come back. And you just think about like, yeah, all the people who like, right can't be part of this for completely geographical reasons. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, completely biased opinion, having that ability to do that, being able to spend the first, I hope to work remote forever, but like being able to be here mm-hmm. during the first couple of years of my son's life, I can't imagine how people did this because <laughs> yeah, yeah. it was not easy and, and i was like here <laughs> the, the right. whole time. so yeah. that's a, an opportunity for sure and then in terms of threats i, I kind of feel like you know the opposite for me is true i know there's that tension all the time right where the industry is trying to figure itself out and you see some studios like going back to return to office yeah hardcore rto right yeah, yeah right? right and everything in between where some people are like Oh, like hybrid or a certain number of days a week. And and even with that, it's like, well, you still have to be in the same. Yeah, you, you have to be within <laughs> an hour or two of that. So <laughs> yeah, right? can, yeah. you can fuzzy it up all you or, want, but you can't be remote. You know, yeah, so, yeah, you can't like go from, from anywhere or the places where you're like state sanctioned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll fly from LA to whatever. Yeah, 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 you can't do that. Yeah. So I think that's the thing I don't like actively worry about, but that every time I see that, I'm like, oh, I wonder if we've like, I just think that there are benefits, right, to to the mm. remote stuff. It, nothing is perfect, and nothing works for everyone. I think right. this is yeah, a this is challenges too, right? But yeah, yeah, you can like talk to a bunch of people, and and they'll have really impassioned and good and correct perspectives on like what works for them. Like some people cannot; they need that separation to go in, or they really just like want to see other people and work. Right. I like loved being in an office. 
office. Yeah. I get a ton of energy from people. So Level X is like the last physical office that I, right. that I worked in. I and I was people. only there for like a couple months, right? Before yeah. the pandemic was in full swing. But right. I, it's such a part of how welcoming that experience was for me. I remember it was just my first week. And then Nicole is dragging me into the kitchen to like do shots or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, never. Shot queen. Like, yeah, she's like, shot, shot, shot. Or yeah. like, yeah, she like made espresso for people every That's right. day. And she like right. get you from your desk and she'd be like, come on, loser. <laughs> right. I got my exp- yeah, I-, I was on that rotation because I yeah, was doing my fix. Yeah. yeah. So what games are you playing right now that you're excited about? Is there anything kind of sticking out that you're into? So I'm currently playing very slowly through Final Fantasy Rebirth. So hmm. like part two of the Final Fantasy VII yeah, remake. Those are long games, right? So I, yeah. This one especially feels long if you do everything, which I sort of am trying to. I feel like it is very different from remake. So I played Final Fantasy, the original, when I was in college. So not when it came out, but like in the early okay. And I basically only remember the Midgard disc. So I don't know how accurate this is to the middle part of the game, but right. it's wild it feels like you were doing something different every 10 minutes and like everything is a bespoke mini game (laughs) my wife like we were playing last night and she had the comment she was like this is never repeat your outfit the game (laughs) (laughs) it's totally true because it'll be like in this sequence you're like the parade marshal in a parade and that will never happen again (laughs) right one and done yeah. yeah, in this sequence, you're like playing piano and it's like really involved <laughs> and everyone's wow. in different costumes and stuff. So it's funny because it or this one, you're like, right. These are so many spoilers. I'm sorry, everybody, for a bunch of mini games. And right, right. Yeah. There's a part where you're like doing like a wave race thing on the back of a dolphin. And it just makes me think of every time we're in a pitch for anything and you try to pitch like a, a unique mechanic right, right. <laughs> and people start to like, <laughs> like Ooh, that's like, a little ah. out there yeah it's like no I, you guys i wanted to have this whole dolphin thing and okay are we going to reuse the dolphin thing and you're like no <laughs> <laughs> right which, which is like how, how did they get that how did they get that through right and, and how did this yeah, game get made it's, you know right it's, like, it's so it's kind of magical in that way just because like if you want to be a super surprised <laughs> and every surprise is kind of like goofy and delightful like that is that's yeah. been my experience with it so far it's been just like really fun to play in short little snippets um and hmm. then the other game that i'm still sort of playing was Baldur's gate 3 that super oh, right. zoomed the back half of last year for me i dip into it and i go to the character creator and i like think about starting <laughs> like right. And then I get kicked out of the pod in the Nautiloid, and I'm like, that's enough for me for now. Yeah. <laughs> but it, yeah, that game, God, it's uh, my favorite games growing up were CRPGs. So the original mm. Fallouts 1 and 2, and then right. Baldur's Gate 2 is maybe my, prior to Baldur's Gate 3, like, which is maybe now my favorite game. <laughs> right. Baldur's Gate 2 was my favorite game, so this feels just such an evolution of those concepts. I was like, wow, this is like the best one of these that like... Right. It's like, like a, a pinnacle, super, like that. yeah, like a super narrative driven Western RPG kind of thing. So yeah, that game, like, you know, one playthrough will take you 160 hours. <laughs> that's, that's intense, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and hats off to someone that can pull that commitment off, you know, to get through all that. Right. Yeah, Another that's... game in a, a totally different way that, that feels like it shouldn't be possible. It kind of bucks the conventional wisdom of how did this happen? How did this yeah. game, like, how did they do this? Yeah. How, what was a Sega game? Where you're like a fish. It was like this weird fish. The one that would talk to you? Yeah, they would talk. talk and to it was, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Um, Is that like yeah. a Dreamcast? It was like a. Exactly. It was like on the Dreamcast. <laughs> it was like a talking fish. And it was just like. But having worked at Turbo Graphics, where we would bring over games from Japan, you know, a lot of times they were like just these crazy concepts that were super popular in Japan. And it was like, what is this? And like, are people going to play this? We're, we're trying to port games over from the PC engine. And it was like some of this stuff like JJ and Jeff, which is weird, crazy, funny, or just bizarre, right? Just like David Lynch or something. I remember Seaman had ads on television. Right. So it was like, wow, the, there's a marketing budget behind this. This wasn't just like, you let f- five people go off and make this little thing. But yeah. When you talk about pitches, I always think of that and it comes from movies, but that joke, when you try and pitch something, it's all kind of out there and different. And you always say at the end, they rein it back in with a little bit of E.T. in it, you know, like, 
Because that, like, oh, okay, heartwarming, big sales, okay, so it's like this and this and this, and people are like, well, but with, with, with a little E.T., you're like, oh, okay, got some E.T. <laughs> in there, this is more palatable now, so that's a way to make to it, ground you. to try to ground, ground it and yeah. sell it to the studios when you say it's got a little bit of E.T. in it. Um, so where can people find you online, like, you know, website or socials or things like that? I, like, regrettably, maybe, am super not on social media right now. I used okay. to be on Twitter, and that was kind of, like, the one thing I did, and now right. I am not. <laughs> right. Yeah, because uh, it's gotten weird. Yeah, right? I have a Blue Sky, but, like, there's literally, I, I'm never on it, and don't follow me on Blue Sky. <laughs> right. But, uh, I, so, like, truly, the real answer is, like, you can find me on LinkedIn, probably, if you yeah. want to talk about literally anything industry-related. That is the one place <laughs> I am, and then it's just my name, right. like, Rex Hanslet. Right. Yeah, I, I find myself more and more on LinkedIn. Um, I feel like, just, I don't know if I'm crazy, stuff I feel like there, LinkedIn but, yeah. has become the game discussion discourse stuff that was on Twitter. Part of it has moved to yeah. LinkedIn. So like no, if you hear LinkedIn, you're like that sucks and that's crazy. You're late. if you haven't been on LinkedIn recently, it feels a lot more like a social media platform than it used to. It's still mm. not the best, but it's wild times there. Yeah, <laughs> right. Now, yeah, it, it's yeah. not uh, like people right. trying to get jobs. It's like people spilling their hot takes and like right. doing. doing yeah. shit posts and stuff. It's kind of crazy. Just about every day, I'll be on LinkedIn like. Wow, I didn't expect to see this. Huh? You're like, You're what like, happened here? Like, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 part of it's refreshing. Then the other part is I go in my email and it's just like a bunch well, of people for, trying to yeah. sell me shit. You know, I'm like, I'm oh, sure. God, yeah. The signal to noise ratio has gotten. I don't gotten bad have like, to be on LinkedIn professionally. I feel like if I did, I would hate it a lot more than I did. It's like when I deleted <laughs> Twitter, this is a really boring story, but like when I deleted Twitter, I was like, I still need something to like scroll. <laughs> So it's right. like, what's going like, to fill that? Yeah, that for me, oh, it's like pathetic and sad because it's not good. But you know, it means if you message me, I'll see it because I'm looking at it at some point in the right. day. Threads has kind of filled that for me from Twitter, mm -hmm. and there's some interesting stuff up there and follow stuff about outside of games like music or things like that. So that's cool. Yeah, I, I've definitely moved you know away from Twitter X or you know, whatever, and just Threads. I, I, I get kind of like that doom scrolling fix which yeah. i'm like ah oh, stop doing that you know other stuff to do i found i was really anxious sometimes when i right. would like stop looking at twitter for a while after and then i was like what if i just stopped doing this and then it kind of like helped me <laughs> right. i was like oh, i don't feel anxious anymore that was like easy you know, like, oh, and like, I, yeah, withdrawals, but now I get over the hump. You, you know, yeah, so think, and yeah. it's like, so everyone is different, and there are maybe people who can do that and not have it like negatively impact their psyche. But yeah, for me, it was like definitely a thing where I was right. like, oh, I just want to know. I just want to know what like garbage thing is going on. Right. I know, but do I want to know like four hours amount? Because like that's what right. I'll do. <laughs> I'll just like look right. at it until there's there's one nothing more scroll, more one more scroll. Yeah, FOMO, yeah. right? Like, what's going on? What am I missing on? Yeah. Um, last question is, what's one piece of advice you give others working in the industry right now, if you had to kind of boil it down? I'm going to repeat something that I sort of said earlier, totally. but like That's having that long view of your career, I think mm -hmm. is like super, super key. And right. for me, what that looked like <laughs> was like doing that in a, like incorrectly for many years. A thing that I learned <laughs> after I left consulting and came to level X was the things that I, that were, I would get like really worked up when stuff happens, like either interpersonally or just decisions I didn't agree with in the business. And I let it impact me in moments where I like wasn't working. Right. And I think that's oh, like, right. Yeah. It's yeah. like when you, you can be frustrated and you can like deal with stuff, but when it's starting to eat up like your weekend or when you can't stop talking about it, like right, your, your personal partner, life, like, yeah. that's actually you that were, I'll say just for me, in my experience, it was like, that was me making like a decision to continue to like, engage with something that was sort of hurting me. And I let it mm -hmm. kind of, poison like some of those experiences and the right. thing that i thought was fascinating was like after i left that job i find that i think more about the positive experiences more than the negative ones and i almost don't think about the negative ones at all and then hmm. some of the people who would like drive me crazy i sort of think of it in more the terms are like oh i wonder if there are things that i did <laughs> Oh, like, right, right, like, yeah. I think a normal person would maybe have in the moment, it took me longer to be like, I probably did things that hastened the sort of divide in this relationship or, or right. whatever. 
And the part about that crazy to me was that that I just like didn't know was that you can feel differently about events that happened to you like later. It's like you will just like come to a different, not necessarily a different conclusion, but it might just not hurt you as much. Mm -hmm. You might just not be that thing that you like obsess over (laughs) all the time. And that is wild. And so with that knowledge of sometimes it's just the thing that you think and feel today might not necessarily persist for a long time. It makes me think about, try to think about not just like this week (laughs) or a milestone for you, like whatever the short term thing that is like giving you hardship is. Cause I think that's a lot of what tends to trip people up in the industry and like their career and try to think of it in terms of, can I envision myself here in six months? Can I envision what am I going to be doing in a year? And right. try to like have that sense <laughs> right. of perspective, I guess. I said a million words, but that's like all it is. You might not think the things that you think now. There will be different things that upset you, but like this thing in like the span of career and everything, unless it's something like truly heinous, which bad things yeah, happen right. to people, that right. sucks. But try not to get wrapped around the axle and try not to, Mm -hmm. I said this earlier, but try not to make your emotional reaction to a bad thing that happens to you eclipse the thing. It's like that happened to me a lot where I would just be like, I can't stop focusing on how bad this makes me feel. (laughs) <laughs> or right. like the unfairness of a situation or something. And mm-hmm. and I think this is something that I've gotten better at with every job that I've had, where it's like you just learn that being it, – it's kind of like a, a privilege that you can – you should try to exist for as long as you can in that space of being – pleasant to the people around you (laughs) you know and as much as you can kind of like try to to not internalize bad things when they happen because like maintaining equilibrium of i can be i'm like i can be good i can find things that are like good about the situation that i am and and if i can't then like i know that like these things won't last forever and i can put a time frame to them like Mm -hmm. those are super valuable skills they're kind of amorphous but i think that like it's really hard to have that perspective if you were going through something, right? And I right. think if I had, if I had could learn anything sooner, I would have loved to sort of have that perspective, like in my twenties, to be like, yeah, yeah. and because I would hear yeah. it. People maybe tried to tell me, but I couldn't hear them because all I could hear was like, "You should calm down." <laughs> like, you should calm down. <laughs> yeah, I was like that in my twenties too. Like, I remember somebody called me the angry young man, which is. <laughs> kind of funny now because i'm the old guy but yeah yeah because it's it's much more raw like it's very visceral when you're younger and you're in the moment but with age and perspective you look back and like it wasn't maybe that bad right like you, you don't feel as emotional about it because you've seen other stuff you've been in other places you you have other contexts to frame it with, right? So it's not as tense as it was back then sometimes. Cause yeah, and, I, and I think sometimes. of like that thing with Nick, right? Where he kind of shut down the right. situation I was feeling. And then we yeah. had like a conversation. It's like, you want to be the person who is perceived to be like that you can be trusted with feedback, right? Yeah. That, like, right. Capable of having a conversation and it's not going to be a, a whole big thing. That's sort right. of what I was trying to say earlier. It's like, would I rather be, the person who's like right all the time, I think I would have said yes until like very recently right. <laughs> in, in my life. But I think of the people who I love working with and would mm-hmm. and, and want to would work with forever, like in the drop of the heartbeat. Like the people right. I think of are like, you know, Chris Mitra, you know, people yeah. like that this who are just awesome. like so professional. So, mm-hmm. you know, just always seems to say the right thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's right. really compassionate, like to his teammates, and is a person who never puts his like stressors sort of like above what is like going on for like the rest of the team. And that made him listen to me like lots of times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, Chris <laughs> like, is awesome. I'm angry yeah. about like whatever. And I think that like that's probably good advice too. It's like think of the people that you like working with. What behaviors are they modeling, and like how can you like adopt like some of those things? Yeah, right. It's um. Kind of like that quote, things aren't as bad as you think they are and things aren't as good as you think they are. <laughs> and you can philosophical, but a little bit of Buddhism about like everything is temporal, right? Like, yeah, this is horrible, but it will pass. And this is amazing, but it will pass and nothing is mm-hmm. final, right? Like, so just having that perspective so that you don't internalize it and like, you know, get all 
spun up about it as much. Yeah, that's that's something I've had to learn over decades yeah. too. Yeah. I think like and not to be like a boring weirdo, but for me, like having kids is like definitely a part of this. Cause yeah, I don't know if no, you right. this way, John, but like I have never experienced such a violent like perspective shift so quickly where I was just like, I can't imagine like the things that I cared about. <laughs> like not right, that I care right. about them, but now it's like, wow, I have a whole new set of sort of priorities and going concerns and the life that I lived before is right. just like not my life <laughs> right, right. anymore. You have to like change so quickly in every facet of your life that it just mm-hmm. made me think like, oh, wow. I think it, unless you're very lucky and very good at introspection and can manufacture that moment of like, let's top to bottom, like <laughs> look, at, right, right. look at our life right now and see if there's anything that we would change or should change. Mm-hmm. Maybe I think normal people maybe do that in therapy. But for me, <laughs> right. I decided to like kind of struggle through my career for 13 years and then have a kid. And now I'm like, oh my God, guys, like, did you right. know? <laughs> right. I used to, yeah. Yeah. And for me, I had twins. I was just like, whoa. This I is heard like, you saying Ooh. that when, when Sam was born and I was like, oh my God, I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. And people are like, oh, I'm like, let me tell you stories. You got <laughs> twins and one screaming and the other one's sleeping. Do you take the one out of the room or you, leave you, you know, it's like this whole, this whole world. And then when you're crunching and trying to ship a game, it was, it was a lot. Um, you know, yeah. For me. Um, no, yeah, I, it I literally, I literally cannot imagine. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, Roxanne, for doing this tonight. It's been great to co- reconnect. Right. Yeah. And be able to share, you know, because it's been a while. Um, well, thank you for having me. I know we've been trying to do this for <laughs> like a yeah. minute. Yeah. I'm glad it came together. No, it's it been all worked out. But like, I feel like I've talked to you probably more recently than I have just because I've gotten to hear your voice <laughs> like on this <laughs> show. But yeah, it was awesome to get to like chat for a while. And that's the part of the reason I do the show is just it gives me a good reason to reconnect with people like you and share these stories. And I think it adds value to people to to hear these stories and like what people go through and and how it's an industry and people are just doing the things and you know all this kind of stuff so yeah that's that's nice to hear yeah i'll try and keep doing this